Hi, I'm Rupert Schofield, President and CEO of the Finca Microfinance Network. We're here in London to attend the Spark the Change Conference, which is a gathering of social entrepreneurs to talk about ways of empowering your employees. The topic of my keynote address is how to create an ethos of trust in a large global organization with thousands of employees. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Rupert. Schofield, I'm the, uh, I'm going to be your uh, speaker for the next couple of minutes or hour or so. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm uh, the president and CEO of the Finca Microfinance Network. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you today about the challenge of creating an uh, ethos of trust inside a big global organization like Finca. Finca uh, started as so many startups do in the US, not in, not in somebody's garage in this case, but in my partner's spare bedroom on Broadway and 67th Street in Manhattan. And today we work in 23 countries of Latin America, Africa, the uh, Eurasia, uh, we work in very challenging places like Afghanistan and the Congo and Haiti, and we provide small loans to micro entrepreneurs in all these markets. We have about 2 million customers at this point. We have 12,000 employees, um, and so you can imagine how challenging it is to run something like this, even with all the wonderful communication technologies, you know, emails and, and uh, you know, con teleconferences and all that. At the end of the day, you know, I as the CEO, I have to trust pretty much every one of those 12,000 people. So, uh, you know, and these, these are people from 50 different countries and cultures. Um, and they have, you know, sometimes very different value systems, uh, and you have to figure out how to decipher that and get everybody working as a team. So uh, anyway, my promise to you is that um, by the end of this, you know, 30, 45 minutes, uh, I'm gonna explain to you how you get all these people to believe that they work in a company that cares about them, is willing to invest in them, and most important will be a place where if they work hard and take care of the customers will be a company that meets their financial, social, and yes, even spiritual goals. So let me uh, go back uh, to our beginnings. Um, and this character up here is what I used to be. Um, <laughs> I think I had parasites or amoebas at the time, so I was a lot slimmer. It was very easy to not gain weight in, uh, in Guatemala where, where I lived. But let me explain to you how I got there. So um, it was 1971. I was in my last year at university, and I got drafted to go uh, to Vietnam where the war was raging and at a point where, in the words of John Kerry, our present Secretary of State and a Vietnam veteran, the war was at the stage where nobody wanted to be the last man to die for a mistake. And uh, so I looked at that option. I had a few other options, but they weren't very appetizing. I could go to jail as a conscientious objector. I could go to Canada, and I love Canada, but it was not in my plans to spend the rest of my life there. Uh, but then I also found about this organization called the Peace Corps, which would send a young man like me to a foreign country to live for two years. And I thought, well, that sounds good. Anything can happen in two years. Maybe the war will end, which in fact it did a year later. Um, but so I met the people and they said, yeah, you'll do. You know, uh, Where would you like to go? And I thought a minute. Jamaica? And they said, no, let's send you to the highlands of Guatemala where we're going to attach you to an agricultural cooperative and you're going to teach these peasant farmers how to grow corn and beans. And I looked at them and I said, you realize I was born in New York City, right? <laughs> uh, they said, don't worry about it, Schofield, we're going to teach you how to be a farmer. <laughs> so 
Uh, they plunked me down in this idyllic tropical paradise, you know, living at 5,000 feet, volcanoes. I mean, just incredible place, but also incredible grinding poverty that I had never seen or even imagined existing in my life. You know, people literally starving to death, trying to scrape by on a dollar a day. Now, even though I'd had a month of, of agricultural training, I didn't believe by any stretch of the imagination that I had been turned into an ag agro agronomic specialist. I figured I would be more of a threat to the farmer's crops than any benefits. I said, well, what else can we do? Well, we decided that what they really needed was credit so that they could buy inputs and increase their yields. So uh, we made them $50 loans. Uh, it worked brilliantly. Uh, we gave them the loans in the form of fertilizer, which we delivered out to their remote aldeas. Some of them lived as much as 35 kilometers away. I had 800 of these uh, members of the co-op all together, and they lived in 35 different villages. And they decided they would use my house in the town of San Martin as the warehouse. But pretty soon I had so much fertilizer I didn't have anywhere to live. So I came up with a, another idea. I thought, you know what, let's move the decentralize the warehouse out to these 35 communities. And you know what, by then I was running ragged and so was my Guatemalan counterparts. We said, I, I proposed to my counterpart, I said, let me train these people to run these little warehouses and you know, disperse the credit, to fertilize around credit, sell the excess if you can. And it worked brilliantly. I trained 35 people and everything was working really well. Um, you know, we had more time to do stuff. But then, uh, just in this one case, this one poor guy, you know, he wasn't so great with the numbers, and he lost track of it. And uh, we went out there, and they were short, or he was short of, you know, a few bags of fertilizer. And he had to dig into his pocket and make up the difference. And he got really pissed at me. You know, he said, you didn't train me, you know, you just threw the papers at me and everything. I felt wretched. Um, but I learned, uh, you know, I, I learned two things from that. Empowering these people was the right thing to do, you know, trusting them to uh, run this operation. But I had screwed up, right, because I didn't train them well enough. So that was sort of the first big lesson I took away. Um, then. Okay, let's go uh, to, let's follow our hero's progress another few years down the line. I came back from the Peace Corps. I kicked around at different jobs. I couldn't find anything as interesting, you know, that filled me with such, such passion as working with these people. So um, I decided to go back to grad school. I, I got two degrees in two years, one in economics, one in administration. And I interviewed with different jobs, and, uh, but to my horror, I would always get to the last interview. You know, it would be at a bank or an agricultural supply company, and they'd say, so are you excited about this job? You know, and I go, ah, you know, I just couldn't fake it. You know, I wanted to get back to that work. But here I was, I graduated, I didn't have a job, uh, I had a baby on the way, and I'm walking disconsolately through the student union and I see an ad looking for ex-Peace Corps volunteers who speak Spanish and can write. So I go, he's looking for me, whoever this is. So I send my resume off, not with any real hope. A week later, I get a letter back. I open it up. There's a check for $1,500 with my name on it, a good start. There's a ticket to the Dominican Republic and a little note saying, you're hired, meet me in Santo Domingo, John Hatch. I go, who is this guy, you know? But John was an exceptional human being, continues to be. Probably the most trusting guy on earth, you know? But not stupid either, hopefully, you know, because here I am, you know, 30 years later, so he must have made the right choice, right? I'm still here. Um, but John, why did he trust me? He read my little, you know, I sent a writing sample of my experience in the Peace Corps, and he read it, and he concluded, this guy has the passion and the heart to do this kind of work. I want him in my business. Anyway, so, um, then we, uh, 
let's fast forward a little more. You know, we went our different ways. We worked a few gigs together, but he didn't have enough business for the both of us, so I ended up going off on my own. But about six years later, we got back together, and John said, you know, here, I want you to, you know, take over the consulting firm. I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, I want to start a foundation. I said, well, how are you going to do that? He said, oh, I'll raise a few million dollars. I said, how long will that take? He said, eh, about six months. Anyway, six years later, uh, we did actually start to raise real money. But in the interim, what were we going to do? You know, we had this idea to build a foundation around a credit scheme, which we called Village Banking, which was amazingly similar to what I had worked with in the Peace Corps. Um, but, uh, you know, in this case, we had no money and we had no staff. So John said, well, let's, let's go train these other NGOs, Care, Save the Children, in our methodology that we invented and let them prove the concept. And I thought, wow, that's risky. What if they screw it up? Then it's dead forever. I said, no, no, we can do it. And, and they're good, you know, They'll, we can trust them. So we trusted them. We trained about a dozen of them. They did a great job. They implemented all these pilots. It worked beautifully. It worked too beautifully in one sense, because what happened? You know, we made a little money in the firm training them the methodology, but then by the third visit we came, uh, you know, to see how things were going, they said, what are you guys doing here? We don't need you anymore. You know, this is dead simple. We can take it from here. You know, so we're going back uh, to the airport, and I, was, and I said, John, what do you think? He said, this is great. I said, John, it's not great. You know, I mean, it's great that they're making it work, but how are we going to live? And I said, look, John, this works so well. It's so powerful. Let's trade for our own account, you know? So I said, okay, cool. So we raised a little money. We found four social entrepreneurs in four different countries. We gave them the village banking manual. We gave them a week of training. We paid them the princely sum of $500 a month, and we gave them each $10,000 in risk capital and said, go. And I don't know whether we picked the right people, whatever. Again, a big chance. We trusted these people with our idea. It worked brilliantly. I mean, it was an idea so powerful back then, you know, microfinance was new, that it just took off. And we had a run of about 10 years, which I think of as the golden years, where we could do no wrong. You know, everything worked beautifully. People showered us with resources. And then suddenly, uh, and this happened to be the year 1994, when I became CEO, I'd been the chief operating officer before then, we suddenly just blam. We started hitting the wall everywhere. Had a million dollar fraud in El Salvador. Our director in Guatemala went rogue and hijacked the whole program. Mexico blew up, our director diverted funds from credit to, into restricted funds into administration. It was a disaster. And, uh, you know, we were, we were, nearly went out of business. And to this day, I honestly, I don't know why I wasn't fired. I mean, I can't figure it out. But here I am 20 years later, still clinging to power. Um, in any case, um, so we failed horribly. So then how did we deal with failure? And this is where it gets interesting. So we, first of all, we said, why did we fail? And we analyzed, you know, what had gone wrong. We had no controls. We had bad governance. We, uh, but most of all, these wonderful people that had run our program that we'd hired for $500 a month, three women and one guy, they were fantastic, but they tried to run everything so tightly, they didn't trust their staff, they didn't hire really competent people, you know, to be, especially to be the CFO, and then they didn't delegate to them because they didn't trust them. So there was a, they had a limited capacity to build a program, and pretty much all of them, around 10,000 clients, blam, they just hit the wall and they failed. So, we said, okay, so what's the lesson here? Well, and I'll share this lesson with you because I, I also had to learn it. When you're building that management team, 
You know, everybody on that team has to be smarter than you in that area, you know? And that's scary, especially with the CFO, you know, because they're managing your money and, you know, but you have to trust them, you know? Because if you hire incompetent, weak people, it's gonna take you down. Anyway, that was a very hard lesson for us. Um, but we also made another big mistake, which I'll share with you for what it's worth. We overreacted. You know, we learned the lesson of the controls and we put in auditors and we, and we became obsessed with stopping a future fraud like we had in El Salvador. And we stopped trusting our people. We almost adopted the, uh, that thing from the X-Files, right? Trust no one. We went from trusting everybody, customers and employees, like, we can't trust anybody, you know? And now that really cost us because we started playing defense for the next decade and we forgot about strategy and above all, we, we didn't notice that the competition had finally woken up People started copying our methodology and they started improving on our methodology. And the competition started beating the pants off us, everybody. We learned, we learned the lesson too well. Anyway, we recovered, uh, I suppose obviously, because you know, we started to grow again. We upgraded our staff. Uh, we, you know, we put in systems and so forth. Um, and we, you know, we became much more strategic um, but, you know, and I, I want to talk later or in just a minute about what we did, you know, with this dilemma of do you trust, you know, and empower or do you not trust, you know, do you not take chances? Because one person can bring you down, you know, one bad apple can bring you down. Anyway, but let me talk first a bit about, you know, what is leadership, you know, because I think, you know, you are all, I assume, uh, leaders of an organization of some size at some stage of development, you know, what, what does that mean? I th and I thought a lot about this, you know, and people say, oh, it's lonely to be a leader and it's tough to be a leader, but it's also great to be a leader. Um, but what, what you know, for, to me, it, it boiled down to three things. Uh, and no, I'm not comparing myself to him, you know, but that was her idea, I think. She put that together. Um, but, you know, I think, it, I think it boils down really to three things. One is destination. You know, where are you going? You know, where are you taking this organization? And, and destination is something that isn't just done once, you know? Like I, I set a destination for our, uh, you know, the Finca network of 300,000 clients, you know? At the time we had like 60,000. Okay, we made it. Now what? Oh. Let's do the same thing, everybody go long. Let's have a million clients, you know? And we made that too. Now, you know, I've had to find another destination for the organization. It's far more complicated now with all kinds of challenges and competition. You know, everyone and their mother coming into microfinance. So it's, it's the destination is more difficult. Uh, I haven't actually come up with it yet, but when I do, I'll let you know. And what's the other thing? Credibility, right? I mean, a leader to, to be effective, I think, has to be credible with the people. And that usually means you've had ex a set of experiences, you've got a toolbox, uh, and people say, this person knows what they're doing. They don't know everything, you know? And that's where you get back to that team, right? You have to figure out, okay, I, do, I know some finance, I know some HR, I know some marketing, you know, but I've got people who know a lot more than me, but I've got credibility because I faced down some challenges, I solved some problems in the organization, and so people, you know, they look to me, you know, for solutions. I don't have all of them, obviously not. And then there's this toughness thing and I, by that, I don't mean that I yell at my employees and scare them and, you know, order them around and everything. No, by toughness, I mean you've got to be ready, you know, if you're going to be, if you're running a company and you're charting new territory, uh, you're going to have contra temps, you know, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to have reverses, and you've got to be tough enough, you know, after you've been knocked down to get back up for what it's worth. There are those three things. 
But there's another thing you have to do. Uh, don't take yourself so seriously, you know? I mean, when you're in a mission-driven organization, everybody's passionate, Every, especially in a startup where you don't have the resources, you don't have the time, you don't have the right people always. It's really tough. Everybody's working their asses off. But you gotta, you know, you gotta lighten the atmosphere from time to time. So in, in my case, you know, I, uh, I, st I don't know why, I just started singing at the beginning of every monthly staff meeting. And then I, you know, and I took out my guitar and I got really dangerous. And then I put together a band, and today I've got my own band. I mean, I suck as a mu musician, but I love music, and so I have the Rupert Schofield Band. And when I started you know, playing, then people came out of the woodwork who had real talent. There was a guy from Belarus who was fantastic, Andre, Scott Graham, you know, cuts his own CDs. I had no idea this talent existed, you know? But when I got up there and made a fool of myself, maybe what I'm doing right now, it was like I gave permission to everybody else to chill, just relax, you know? And I, and I love it, you know? And it's great being the king, right? Because like, you know, nobody, you know, nobody ever dares to tell me that I suck, you know? <laughs> and I have my own TV channel, you know? I mean, it's on this thing called YouTube. You probably never heard of it, but there's the Rupert Schofield. It's not the Rupert Schofield show. It's the Rupert Schofield channel. How great is that? Anyway, so have some fun. Uh, and then, of course, there's the sacrifice part, right? I mean, when you're leading an organization, you know, the organization has its needs, and it, it takes on almost a life of its own, and it makes demands on you constantly, and your people make demands on you constantly, and you always have to be putting that example out there, and you always have to put yourself in last place, you know, take care of everybody else, take care of the organization, and then if there's anything left, <laughs> any time for yourself, okay, then that's for you. All right, so, uh, so where did we come out? So we've come out in many ways back to our roots with this whole thing, you know, this whole balancing act of, you know, how much do you trust your employees and how much do you, you know, take care that you're checking up on them and auditing them and all this stuff. And so we came out in this middle ground between blind trust and no trust. I mean, no trust is, is not gonna work ever. It just, you just can't do it. You're not gonna attract the right employees. Your employees are gonna be unhappy and they are gonna turn off and drive away your customers, probably. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been on a plane like I have where you know, an airline just had a merger and the employees are just so unhappy and they don't hide it, you know? You say, hey, I wanna complain about the service. They go, yeah, doesn't it suck, you know? <laughs> I hate working for this company, you know? So you obviously you don't want that. Um, but also, you know, you have to be able to de detect and weed out those bad eggs with your systems and your controls and so forth. But that doesn't mean you create an atmosphere of distrust. Your employees have to believe that you trust them and you count on them and you have to show, show that. You have to delegate to them. You have to give them real power. You have to give them permission also to make mistakes, right? I mean, because you can't innovate if you keep doing the same thing. And so innovation means you gotta take risks, try new stuff and you can't do everything, so, you know, our 12,000 em employees have permission to take chances and to take risks and to try new stuff. Now, you ha again, you, ha you can't give that blanket authorization, go ahead, do anything, you know? I mean, you've got to make sure that when they're doing stuff, it it's doesn't carry a risk that could actually tank the whole company. Anyway, um, I want to wrap with... Uh, a story about my absolute favorite customer in Finca. This woman is Naima. She's from Uganda. She had an incredible story. I went, I went, uh, I met her when she'd been with Finca about seven years. And her story was she 
was at one point in her life supporting seven daughters. She'd been divorced twice because her two husbands wanted sons, and they just, you know, they just threw her out. And she was making a living cleaning people's houses in Jinja, Uganda, and she was washing her kids' clothes with dirty dishwasher, uh, dish, uh, dishwater, sorry, from her, uh, from her customers, and she was feeding her family with table scraps from the, table, from the dinners of her, of her customers. Then she found out about Finca. She started taking loans from Finca. She started trading fruits and vegetables in the market. She was incredibly adept at it. She just needed that little amount of capital. And seven years later, when I met her, she had a restaurant where she employed her entire family. Two of her daughters were in university. She'd built a house. She had land. I mean, it was just a fantastic you know, story. Um, but then I went back more recently, and uh, you know, I asked about how's Naima doing, and somebody said, oh God, it's tragic. She, uh, you know, she, her mother got sick, she had to attend to her mother, and uh, her business failed, and then she got sick, she got cancer, she fell into the hands of a quack doctor who ripped her off, I mean, she's, she's a wreck. I said, no, this can't be, you know? So I met with her, and I told her, Naima, you, you, know, you are Finca. You're, you represent everything that Finca's trying to do. So I want, you to be, I want you to work for us. I want you to be our ambassador. I want you to work with other women who were at the stage you were at and coach them. Tell them your story you know, and how you succeeded. And she embraced this job so much, she actually made that uniform herself. And she now goes out and she talks to our customers and she tells them, Finca will never let you down. You know, you've got, to, you've got to do business. There's many banks you can do business with in Uganda, but you need to be with Finca because they're different. They care about you, you know, and they won't let you fail. And, you know, we did, I didn't do this because of that, but, right, I trusted her, I cared about her, and now she's repaying us and she's actually now given us a model, you know, for how we can take our most successful clients and have them become uh, the best promoters of Finca that we could ask for. So that was pretty much all I wanted to say to you. Um, and I'd be happy to give you guys a chance to say something, <clears throat> you know, any questions you have or whatever. Oh, <laughs> thank you. What's up? Oh, yeah. All oh, right, right. Of course, we have to do the crass promotion. This, this is a book I wrote that sort of tells the story of Finca, but not, not exclusively. Um, you know, the origin of this was I just started making notes one day, and I called up an agent of a friend of mine. I'd been trying to publish novels all my life. Uh, with no success, but then I got smart and I called an agent and to my amazement she said, you know what, you, uh, this is a very timely theme, social enterprise, and you're the perfect person to write it, so give me a proposal. So uh, we, I, it took me about a year to do the proposal, but uh, it sold like the first week it was out there. Um, so anyway, there's there's that. Ah, yes. <laughs> and you knew, I, you knew I had my own television station. And you know I have my own band. I also have my own radio show. Uh, not really a radio, okay, but it's a podcast. You know what that is? So uh, we've done a couple of these. It's a lot of fun. Who knows, maybe one day one of you will help me out and come on the show. Um, but it's at so sock int soakint podcast.org. So uh, ask me anything. <clears throat> I suppose, you know, that experience early in the 90s, I think you said when yeah. someone let you down a business partner or whatever, did yeah. that sort of affect your trust in later years or did it take a while to get over that? Yeah. 
I mean, it, it really did. I mean, it, it hurts whenever someone betrays your trust, right? Whether it's in business or in your personal life, it's devastating, you know, especially when it's somebody who you thought was on your side and working with you, and then suddenly you discover, wow, they betrayed me, right? But that can't color your vision of, wor of the world and life, right? Because most of the people you can trust, right? So that, that's where that toughness comes in, you know? You take, you take the hit and you say, all right, I learned something. Uh, and, and you learn, and probably the biggest thing I learned was, you know, I can't just hire people to work at Finca because they really know their stuff, you know? I have to ask them that question about their values, you know, like, why do you want this job, you know? Because it doesn't pay that well, you know? Oh, well, you know, this and that. If, if they don't say something about, well, I care about poverty in the world, you know, and I wanna, you know, I've made my money or whatever. I, I get a lot of people who've been very successful but they feel very empty, you know. They have a bucket of money, but uh, as one of, one of my uh, regional directors for Africa, he had been in the Peace Corps, then he went into big time banking for 30 years, and when he saw this ad, he came and he said, I said, why do you want this job? He said, I need to recover my soul, you know. I did so many bad things as a banker. <laughs> I need to be redeemed. Uh, so, you know, I look for those people, and so the chance of betrayal is still there, you know, but uh, it's much, much less, you know. In, in the cultures where we work, there's often a one mistake and you're out thing. You know, you screw up, and if you're dumb enough to admit it, you're gone, you know. So what I do is I, I tell people, all right, look, we, we have to innovate, you know, uh, but I'm, you know, you, you can't take a big risk that's going to, you know, throw all the chips on the table and if it works, great, you know, we hit the jackpot and if it fails, we go out of business. So I say, let's try, you know, with some small stakes, you know. Go ahead, you know, like when I, I say, look, you know, you're, you're just not, you know, you're acting like you need permission for me to do absolutely everything. You don't, you know, I don't have time to be into your knitting, you know, all the time. So go out. Do, when I hire somebody new, I give them enormous latitude. You know, I say, just let me see what you can do. You know, I want to see what potential they have. Then if they, you know, make a screw up, we have a talk. I say, okay, no problem. You know, what did you learn from it? Now, if they say, I didn't screw up, then I'm worried, you know, because if you can't admit that you made a mistake, you don't learn, right? When, when I interview somebody, one of the questions I always ask is I always say, tell me about a time that you did something that lost your company a lot of money or caused a lot of damage. I say, hmm, I can't really think of one. Okay, how about a time you made a mistake in your personal life, you know? No, I really can't think of one, you know? Oh yeah, I did make a mistake once. I worked too hard, you know? <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> there was one guy, though, I, I interviewed from India and he, uh, to work in Tanzania, and he said, I've never made a mistake. I said, okay. I said, but when you come to Finca, I promise you, you will make a mistake. Because I've had the best people, most talented people on earth, and they all screw up eventually in Finca, because it's just so challenging, you know? And he said, I will never screw up for you, Mr. Schofield. And he actually didn't. I mean, I hired, I was just so intrigued. <laughs> he, well, he hasn't yet, anyway. But, you know, that idea of giving, giving people, like, not, not the whole casino, but just a pile of chips, go for it. Try something new, you know? Now, here's another, you know, tough one, right? You get in an argument with your uh, direct report, right? And they just absolutely say, no, no this is the way to go, and you say, no, that's not the way to go, I, that's not going to work. No, no, they insist, and you say, all right, you don't, you don't say you can't do it, say, okay, do it, but if you screw up, there's going to be consequences, right? I'm not saying I'm going to sack you, but, you know, I'm going to definitely give you a harder time 
the next time you tell you disagree with me about the way forward. Now I've been wrong, you know, and thank God I've been wrong. A lot of, I, and I love to be wrong when I tell somebody this is not going to work. They do it anyway, and it works. I go, wow, good for you. Here, take my job. <coughs> So, so in one of the last lectures, the principle was you need to have a very equal and non-hierarchical business. Do you mm -hmm. agree with that, or is that something you would say it yeah. doesn't really hasn't really worked in my world? Yeah, my partner John Hatch definitely believes that. <laughs> That's why I became the CEO, and he was the visionary, you know, and the founder. I mean, our first org chart was a circle, you know, where everybody had exact the same <laughs> power and uh, it, it was very interesting but you know we we also had a uh, a board of directors which was comprised of you know people from industry and regular type straight laced corporations so uh, th this is all recounted in my book how you know we somehow found the balance between these you know idealistic Peace Corps volunteers and these hard-nosed corporate types Somehow it worked, and, and we're still all together, you know, the four people that started this thing. Um, you know, I mean, we're a financial institution, you know, and we have to be recognizable <coughs> to the outside world, you know, to investors and regulators and everything. If I went to, like, say, the bank of, Central Bank of Uganda with my org chart as a circle, I think they might yank our license away, you know, but that doesn't mean, you know, that because you have a hierarchy, it's like you're the general and here's the colonels and the captains and, you know, everybody just takes orders. My, I mean, I have a big management team and, you know, we pr basically discuss every major decision. I mean, you know, and, and hopefully we, we strive for consensus. It takes a longer time. And the, and the refugees from, you know, straight up banking tear their hair out because we take so much time to make decisions. But I, I explain to them, look, this is going to be faster because if you and I just decide and pass the orders and it hasn't been vetted with the team, I promise you the reasons why we can't do it that way will just be endless, you know, because and, 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 and yeah, they'll come up with a lot of stuff we didn't know or we didn't think about. You know? Very inspiring, very motivating. And the way you use trust and told the stories and the way you explain how trust works, especially that last story or second but last story with the guy who said he had not failed and then actually didn't. <laughs> When your experience was different, like you like to work with people who admitted failure, admitted, uh, showed learning. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think. An important thing about trust is that you need to give a little more than you actually have mm -hmm. and let enable people to surprise you. And yeah. apparently they did, and I love it. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> well said, well put. <coughs> no. yeah, yes, we, we're going to use that. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, I'm not aware of everything you guys are doing, but, you know, I mean, you're my. You're my family, you know, the social enterprise family. I mean, I think we're breaking new ground. We're changing, you know, the way the economy is going to work. Uh, we're changing, you know, the way, the way stuff is done. We're creating, I hope, a better world, right? And we're revolutionaries, so it's tough, you know? We're going to have our, our moments, but if there's anything I can do, to help you guys out, you know, let me know. All right? Okay. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that talk as much as I did giving it. I uh, thought it was an excellent group, very engaged, terrific questions. If you have any questions, please look me up on Twitter or at my website, rupertschofield.com. <laughs>